not a big deal. All right, getting started here. Um, we are without Patty Egan, our uh, usual um, uh, our usual facilitator. She is on her way back from a tropical destination, but we are going to uh, persevere without her. Uh, and I have uh, Paul McKinley here with me today who will be speaking, but is also pinch hitting uh, to help facilitate this meeting today. And I'll be telling you lots more about Paul here in a minute. Um, we like to start off these meetings with introductions of new faces or people who have been shy in the past. Um, this is a friendly crew. Uh, and we would love to hear who you are and uh, what your connection is to hydrogen efforts and the hydrogen ecosystem in Alaska. Um, do we have any new fa faces here? Go ahead and just, you can speak up, you can raise your hand. Uh, we'd love to uh, hear who you are. John, please go ahead. Hi, I'm John Farrow. I'm the executive director of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, a small independent federal agency. I'm also joined uh, by Mark Myers, a commissioner who's here today. And our recent interest in hydrogen are specifically in the geologic or natural uh, uh, hydrogen. We're particularly interested in that. Thanks. Over. Thank you, John. And I do see Mark Myers. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, Mark Myers, um, as John said, a commissioner with a commission. Um, but my past life was uh, commissioner of DNR, uh, vice chancellor research university and director of the USGS. And, and my early career was in the petroleum industry as an exploration geologist. Um, so I'm really interested in the concept of logical hydrogen being applied to Alaska. And we've done some initial screening work with the commission and it doesn't seem to be very much on the radar our geology looks favorable, uh, in our opinion. And I've had some discussions with uh, USGS efforts to date, and um, we can talk more about that later, but we have an opportunity to have um, the, the head of the USGS on geological hydrogen come up for the Arctic encounter. So we're, we're excited about that. And Erwin, you're gonna be part of that panel. So, so yeah. anyway, efforts to accelerate and there is i know there's interest in the department of natural resources as well uh in kind of next steps might be with geological hydrogen because we need a leasing program we need a geological assessment there's a lot of fundamental questions i know in terms of it but uh as a geologist uh i'm pretty excited about it awesome thank you very much and john and mark um if you're so inclined we ask you to put your contact info in the chat uh, which will allow others in the group to reach out to you about uh, the topics you touched on, uh, as well as for us to collect those email addresses to be added to reminders about future hydrogen working group meetings. So um, please uh, add that to the chat there and um, we'll be sure to connect with you for future, um, future meetings. And this will allow others to uh, get in touch with you as well. Um, perfect, thank you, John. All right, uh, Doug, I see your name, uh, your hand up. Please uh, introduce yourself. Hi, so I'm Douglas Keller. I'm a postdoc researcher in uh, Paris, France, actually. Um, I'm an alumni of UAF, and I've been ASAP quite a bit. Uh, and I'm just kind of being a fly on the wall for these meetings. Uh, I'm, my project is actually building a demonstrator here in Paris uh, that does carbon yeah, capture uh, from the ocean. And... Part of that process includes uh, extracting, well, sorry, desalinating ocean water and then electrolyzing it to produce hydrogen because we use the hydrogen to form synthetic fuel with captured carbon. So I'm just kind of curious what's going on in Alaska. Uh, I grew up there, so it's kind of important to me. Well, figure it out and bring your expertise back to Alaska so we can do that here. How, how does that sound? <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Okay, great. Thank you. And could you please put your contact info uh, into the chat. Uh, Matt Harvey, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, Matthew Harvey. This is my first meeting, so I figured I'd introduce myself. I work in the state legislature, and before that, I was in oil and gas project management. Um, not very well versed on hydrogen technologies or anything surrounding it, so I'll probably be pretty quiet, but uh, just as a personal interest, wanted to learn more, and I'll put my contact info in the chat as well. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. We appreciate you being here. Welcome. 
Mr. McIntosh, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, Aaron, everybody. This is RJ McIntosh hailing from the great city of Seattle, Washington. Cousins to Alaska, right? But uh, I used to live in uh, Anchorage, so this is uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I have a, a consulting company that's tied to uh, Department of Energy headquarters. And to keep this short, uh, we specialize in unique federal funding opportunities. Uh, and specifically, we specialize in advancing next generation technologies to commercialization under what we call OTA, Other Transactional Authority. The Department of Energy has two separate OTAs or transaction authorities, whereby we can bring federal funding uh, a lot sooner rather than later. And we've got a bit of a cliche, uh, and that cliche is do not FAR on my OTA. We don't like the FAR, we don't play with the FAR. We stay within the confines of that OTA framework, identify, advanced next generation technologies, in this case, all things hydrogen related. And at present, uh, we're working with three different federal laboratories, Sandia, Los Alamos, and Lawrence Berkeley. So it's my personal hope that for information purposes only, uh, we can bring forward advanced next generation technologies. Uh, let me preface, not a sale job, but to be able to demonstrate uh, technology measurement and verification white papers from the federal laboratories so that the team or the group can see what's hot, what's not, and what federal dollars can be attached, again, under the auspices of OTA. Back to you, Aaron. Thank you. And RJ, if you have any um, links um, or an email address where people can get more information about all the things you just listed, that would be terrific. Um, please put it in the chat so people can follow up with you. Uh, I see a participant by the name of M. Silta. I don't, I don't, I don't want to take a venture on the name there, so I will let you introduce yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, this is Maddie Silta. Um, I'm an engineer at NSTAR in Anchorage. And yeah, I just wanted to call in. I know some guys from NSTAR call into these occasionally, so just want to see what was going on. Thank you, Maddie. And uh, if you're so inclined, please put your contact info into the chat sure. and we can loop you into future meetings. Uh, Patty will be compiling this information afterwards uh, when she gets off her plane from her tropical vacation destination uh, and can loop you in. Great. So thank you very much for being here. Lots of new faces. This is great. Mr. Borsky, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Anthony Borsky. I am the director of the project management office for Nell Hydrogen. Uh, we manufacture PEM and alkaline electrolyzers, and we use um, a local uh, Alaskan uh, engineering company by the name of Kaufman Engineering to design all of our multi-megawatt systems. So Justin was kind enough to invite me to the meeting, and I'm just uh, happy to be among so many smart people. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Anthony, please put your contact info into the chat, uh, along with maybe a company website as well. Sure, sure, um, sure. That would be great so people can follow up with you. Um, let's see, I, I see, Manny Silt, do you still have your hand up? I'm assuming you don't still wanna talk, um, but I'm going to now move to uh, Shaw C4. I'm, I, I don't know who that is, so please introduce yourself. Hey, Aaron, I'm Chinmay. Um... Oh, hi, Chin May. <laughs> hey, yeah, you probably, I don't know if you remember me, but yeah, I used to, be, I used to work at ASAP. I was, did my PhD there. So I recently joined Caterpillar. Um, I work here as a senior electrical engineer, senior controls engineer for hydrogen and fuel cell systems. So Caterpillar has been uh, doing some work on hydrogen fuel cell based Recording systems for electric, electric power, power applications, power uh, locomotive. Uh, locomotive. So, yeah, that's I mean, I've been attending this meeting past couple months, but I was shy to introduce myself. So, but um, today I thought I will just introduce myself. So, yeah. 
Well, welcome to me. Of course, I remember you. Um, where are you located these days? I am in Peoria, Illinois. Awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, I always I forgot everyone's supposed to say where they're calling in from when they introduce themselves. I think most of you referenced it. So uh, that's uh, appreciated. Um, and to me, please put your contact info into the chat and we can follow up with you um, for future meeting announcements. And this allows other participants to follow up with you as well. Definitely. Um, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other new participants or people who have been shy or quiet on past meetings who uh, are finally finding the gumption to introduce yourselves? It's a new year. It can be a new you. Uh, it's a friendly group. Uh, and we'd love to know who you are and um, what your interests are in this space. Aaron, this is Jeffrey Moore, and I don't know how to raise my hand. I, you I have the floor. Know. Go ahead. Um, I, I was hoping, uh, Ray Wadsworth would be on here, but I'm working with, uh, Ray Wadsworth. And then we uh, connected with Ben Loeffler at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And Ray has, uh, designed, uh, a wave energy, uh, unit and then, uh, some current units. And our background is not in, uh, uh, you know, we're like pilots and, oh, there's Ray. I'll let Ray, you go ahead and you, you introduce yourself and you go. Oh, <clears throat> well, I tell you what, I just I just barely got the uh, computer figured out to do this. So I got here a little bit late, but but uh, my background's in boat building, marine construction. And uh, and uh, I've been a boat operator since I was a little kid. And uh, like like Jeffrey, I was spent quite a few years as a spotter pilot for my boat and other boats as well in the Alaska thing. Anyway, we've developed a system. Uh, I pat actually patented a system to convert wave energy, waves, and and I'm not the first to try this, but mine's different, to uh, <clears throat> to make electricity, to make power, and ultimately we'd like to make hydrogen with it. So that's our our big objective. Uh, instead of having a rig that you could catch codfish, you could be out there making hydrogen instead. So anyway, that's that. Terrific. And Ray, where are you calling in from today? <laughs> well, I'm actually in southern Idaho, but I'm from Seldovia, Alaska. My home. Wonderful. Wonderful. And Jeffrey, where are you calling in from? I'm in Anchorage and Great. Uh, I'm putting I'm putting together a presentation here. So if you're available sometime later this week, I could let you look at it with, with, with everything. And and we're looking I'm I'm gathering up letters of support to support our grant application. All right, all right. Happy to talk to you more about that offline. Um, I'll just remind folks, if you aren't speaking, uh, to please mute yourself just so we can avoid background noise. Um, otherwise, we may hear who knows what, dogs, cars, planes, trains, uh, you name it. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, any other new faces? Uh, anyone else want to introduce yourselves? Hi, Dr. Whitney. This is PJ Callahan with CTE. I've uh, been on a couple of calls in the past. Uh, this call tends to conflict with some other meetings I have, but I uh, just wanted to, I guess, reintroduce myself to some of the new faces in the group. Um, I'm with the Center for Transportation and the Environment. We're a nonprofit uh, organization focused on zero emission transportation solutions. Uh, I've specialized in our medium heavy duty hydrogen vehicle deployments. Uh, looking at uh, primarily port applications and, and drage vehicle applications. And we've met uh, and worked with all the Launch Alaska folks the past couple of years on organizing their Clean Transportation Leadership Roundtable. And we're looking into some applications up at the Port of Alaska for uh, some, some fuel cell powered equipment, uh, as well as with the airport. So just tuning back in here, um, now that there's uh, several funding opportunities coming in down the pipeline over the next several months. And uh, yeah, just curious to see how, how things are evolving up in Alaska. And I was Wonderful. born in Anchorage, so a little ah. bit of, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, PJ. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, and PJ, and this goes for uh, Ray and Jeffrey and others, if I didn't mention it for you, please put your contact information in the chat. This way we'll be able to make sure you're included in our distribution list for future meetings, and it will allow other people uh, in the group to follow up with you um, with any shared interests or questions. So um, anyone else who might be 
interested in introducing themselves. Okay. I think that was enough of an awkward pause. So we will dive into just a few quick updates and then uh, we will um, have our presentation for the day. A um, couple things on, on some of our breakout topics. Um, uh, the first one pertains to the hydrogen opportunities report. Uh, it I had really hoped to have the final um, approved, reviewed, version ready today. It is going through final approvals um, so that we can get it out. Uh, it will probably be published through ASAP um, and then you know approvals to publish it through uh, DOE take even longer. Yeah. So um, I, I know you're all anxious, but I, I think many of you have seen the draft when we opened it up for comments. Um, so you know the general, the general um, flavor of the report. Um, but we will hope to be releasing that soon and just thank everyone for their patience as well as their uh, contributions. Um, the review process and getting all the sign-offs is, is a little bit more uh, involved than, than one might think. Uh, so that is coming soon. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and I um, sent this out, or I had pa asked Patty to send this out to the group, um, I think it was last week, uh, there is a new um, consortium being developed and led by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, along with some other laboratories, I should mention, uh, the Clean Hydrogen Technology Alignment Cooperative, um, CHITAC, uh, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly, and they are gathering contacts for interested parties to participate in one or more of six working groups. Um, and uh, there's a working group on uh, production by electrolysis, production by non-electrolysis, distribution and storage, uh, transportation, uh, hydrogen derivatives and transportation, uh, and transformation, sorry, and then also hydrogen for power and heating. Um, what I am going to do here is put um, the email address that you should uh, reach out to if you are interested in uh, being a member of this consortium or just being a member of some of these working groups. Um, the official deadline to get in touch with them has, uh, has passed, but I have uh, good information from the organizers that they're still accepting inquiries. Um, I, if you um, need a refresher on uh, the groups, feel free to reach out to me. Um, directly and I can send you that email again. I'm gonna put my email address into the um, chat here if you need to follow up on that. But again, this is if you didn't see the email that was sent out to the working group distribution list uh, last week. So, um, and they invite participation from, you know, any interested members uh, in the community. Uh, and it's the goal is to facilitate discussions around best practices, safety, community engagement, um, standardization to accelerate deployments, uh, technology gap identification and solutions, et cetera. So um, I hope it turns into a good community and dialogue uh, and encourage those who are interested and have the time uh, to engage. Uh, and I think it's really important to have uh, some Northern and Arctic stakeholders um, represented in these conversations. So again, um, if you need more information on that, follow up with me directly, um, both the address uh, to uh, get involved with the consortium, as well as my address, um, are listed in the chat there. Um, all right. Um, let's see. I, I want to just put it out uh, to the crew right now for any um, project developments or project effort updates. We typically try to keep these pretty short uh, because we do have a presentation that we'd like to feature today, um, but we'd love to allow a little bit of time here for quick updates for the good of the group. And I see that Doug has his hand up. So Doug, um, I know you have lots of exciting news today. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Erin. Uh, we have tremendously exciting news. We were awarded the uh, DOE's uh, uh, Hydrokinetic Energy Grant or Cook Inlet. So we're, we're moving full forward uh, on that project. It was a $3 million grant. It's phase one of a potentially a, over $20 million project. 
Um, and we were successful. We put a lot of work into that effort and it's been a long time coming. And uh, we we were so far behind, we decided we were gonna move forward even without the grant. So there was a, there's a turbine working its way to Alaska already for it to be splashed this summer. So uh, they were very thrilled and happy uh, that DOE uh, saw the light and uh, and uh, decided to go with Cook Inlet. And uh, we're very excited. There'll be, there'll be uh, an ORPC turbine as well as a, uh, uh, some of the other industry uh, participants turbines as well in the in the development. Thanks. And for those who don't know what the acronym stands for, ORPC is Ocean Renewable Power Company. Um, but I assume most of you know that. Uh, so yeah, get in touch with Doug there. Uh, if uh, you would like to follow up with him, I'm really happy for you, Doug. And uh, go forth, do great things. Thanks. Any other, any other um, updates for the group? Okay. I will note there is a DOE follow out on the street. Um, I We can send that out with our notes. Um, it's been out for some time here, but um, anyhow, I don't have the name of it or the link off the top of my head uh, to multitask while I'm leading the meeting here. So we will, we will send that out. Um, okay. We, I think without further ado, will move on to our featured presentation. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Paul McKinley, who is a joint uh, fellow, uh, jointly supported through both the university as well as uh, the Arctic Energy Office. He is located up in Fairbanks, uh, working in the Arctic Energy Office um, space up there. And he joined our office in uh, November. So he's only been on board for a couple months, uh, but his, his job is to engage with hydrogen uh, efforts and conversations in the state to make progress towards a potential future deployment. Uh, and so he gets to develop, he gets to devote all his time to thinking about uh, how to make that happen, uh, which is really exciting for me because I don't have that kind of time anymore. Um, and uh, Paul is, has, he's been, He's been talking to, you know, communities that are interested in hydrogen. He's going to highlight some of his uh, conversations today. And, um, you know, he's doing not just modeling, but also trying to get down to, uh, you know, what the actually what the actual on the ground and operational challenges are. You know, we can have all the models in the world, but then, you know, is it going to be some, you know, valve or fitting that trips us up at the end of the day because we didn't think about cold weather adaptations? So those kinds of things, that's obviously a very simplistic example. Um, and also, Paul just got back from a whirlwind tour of some really interesting uh, conferences and workshops. He went to the uh, hydrogen infrastructure workshop, I think it's called, uh, two weeks ago in Denver. Um, and then also was just at uh, a kickoff meeting um, for the Earnest Consortium, which is a DOE consortium being led by Stanford. Um, I will let him spell that acronym out, um, but it's all around uh, uh, grid resilience, and he is uh, working on a piece related to microgrids and um, hydrogen applications in Alaska for that project. So all of these pieces are part of his portfolio, with the big umbrella being um, trying to, to make progress and and aid all the conversations that are helping, uh, th that are occurring around hydrogen in our state right now. So we're so, so happy to have this resource um, here. And we're also really grateful uh, to the university for um, you know helping to sponsor his time. It's a great collaborative effort and um, I'm really hoping the state benefits. So with that, um, I am going to hand the floor over to Paul uh, to take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, I'm just going to get my slides sharing here. And let's see if that works. Is that showing up for everybody? And yes. Can you hear me okay? All right. Yes. Okay. Thumbs up and thumbs up. Perfect. Um, well, 
Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Paul McKinley. Um, as Aaron mentioned, um, I'm jointly supported by ASAP and the DOE Arctic Office, um, uh, working in Fairbanks to investigate hydrogen in Alaska. Um, uh, as Aaron alluded to, the, the goal of today's session is to um, sort of discuss and actually really solicit feedback from this group about these on the ground, what we're terming operational challenges um, associated with uh, an, an actual hydrogen installation pilot. Um, so uh, today, uh, this is a little bit of a different structure um, to the norm for the working group, um, but the idea is, uh, you know, under this goal of trying to um, uh, both have a presentation, but also a group discussion around these operational challenges, uh, give a little bit of an overview of the type of hydrogen pilot system that we're considering. In this case, this is in the context of uh, Kotzebue. We've been working with uh, KEA and, and uh, getting some really valuable input from them. Um, and they're sort of a willing community partner. Um, but the types of themes and challenges that we're discussing are, are really broadly applicable to um, not just uh, uh, microgrid based communities around the state, but, um, you know, towards larger systems like the rail belt. Um, but for today's purposes, I want to sort of set the context for the type of microgrid uh, system that we're considering, uh, then give some examples um, of where this model has been implemented in other parts of the country and the world. Um, and then go into this sort of bi-directional presentation and discussion um, in which uh, I'll outline some of the um, uh, on-the-ground challenge areas that we're currently thinking about here at ASAP and Arctic Energy and some potential uh, pathways forward. Um, but we'll ultimately want to uh, sort of pause and allow for some group input. So this session is really um, uh, as much about listening um, uh, to your feedback as uh, experts either in Alaska or, or your respective technical areas of expertise um, as it is about you know, presenting to the group. Um, so in that vein, the model that we're hoping to use here uh, is to uh, send out a link for a collaborative Google Jamboard. Um, and about halfway through the presentation, we'll shift into this mode of um, uh, uh, sort of I'll give an overview of um, these four topics on the left here and uh, pause to allow time for some uh, sort of short questions or, or feedback. Um, but during that time, we'd really encourage folks to sort of go over to that uh, shared board link um, and uh, give a, a short uh, synopsis of your written feedback. Um, the idea being that you know, this is a really broad topic, right? The, what we're talking about is, you know, what does it take to get a physical pilot uh, installation in Alaska? Um, and so since we're limited on time, we want to make sure that we can sort of record everybody's ideas, hopefully allow time for discussion at the end. Um, but uh, uh, we'll at least have the record so that we can follow up with folks um, and have it for our, our own uh, records. Um, so I'm just going to briefly stop sharing. I, I actually already see that somebody's contributing to the Jamboard, but um, just so that uh, um, I can give that overview here, uh, let me see if I can. And stop I put the sharing. link. I put the link into the chat. Um, for folks just to make sure it works. Uh, you don't need to enter anything yet. We'd like you to really key into Paul's presentation, but we'll put the link in again as, as we get closer there. Great. Um, and so I'll just briefly hop over to that board. Um, so hopefully everyone is now seeing a different screen. This should, it's a, the, the Google Jamboard. Um, and so essentially there's a, a board here for each of the topics that I'm going to cover. Um, and we'll ask that you sort of just add your feedback as an, essentially during the presentation while, while I'm talking and during uh, the, the brief Q&A after each topic. You can do that by just going over to this panel on the left here and adding a sticky note. So here's a note. And then it's automatically on the board. We know that this model um, can become space constrained. So, uh, you know, brevity is always appreciated, but uh, ultimately we'd rather have more ideas than uh, not enough. So, um, you know, please contribute what you can. Um, and like I said, we'll try to open it up for uh, a more open discussion after we consider each topic. 
So um, I'll just briefly pause and ask if there are any questions on that um, format for today. Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I'll just keep going. Um, so uh, I want to give a little bit of context for um, the system that we're considering in Kotzebue, and I'm not actually, so, there we go. So uh, uh, just from hearing some introductions, it seems like there's maybe a, a, a different, different perspectives on hydrogen or, or levels of engagement with hydrogen. Um, but the type of pilot that we're really talking about here is, is a power to hydrogen to power system. So um, that involves uh, an electrolyzer and a fuel cell um, and uh, intermediate storage between the two. The idea being that you will divert some of your excess generation from renewables um, towards producing hydrogen, which you can store and then run back through a fuel cell to uh, 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 generate electricity once again, which can either go to a standalone application or back onto your, your microgrid uh, uh, bus system. Um, for context, uh, in Kotzebue, these are kind of the benchmark reference numbers that we're looking at. So, um, uh, you know, about just under two megawatts of wind and uh, uh, over 500 uh, kilowatts of solar with some uh, planned additions along the way, um, all contributing to a uh, community load, which is currently supported uh, primarily by diesel gensets of around two and a half megawatts with a peak load of uh, around three and a half megawatts. So um, the motivation for looking at hydrogen for uh, either Kotzebue or, or other microgrid based communities is as you scale up renewables, you want to make sure that you have enough storage so that you can have continuous uh, electricity supply. Um, to be clear, though, the type of uh, system that's shown here, this one megawatt system, will be a demonstration project and could be uh, geared towards a standalone application or potentially used as emergency backup power. It's probably not providing you seasonal level storage uh, just with the, with the scale that we've uh, written in here. Um, but the idea is that this would be an incremental step, getting a hydrogen pilot in Alaska on the ground um, uh, to demonstrate the feasibility and then move towards larger systems um, later on. So uh, to uh, sort of highlight these operational challenges, essentially everything shown here, these are things that we can model and there's already been some work at ASAP to to do this, and, and that's what we'll be continuing on with the Ernest project, which I'll talk about uh, momentarily. But today's session is focused on everything that isn't captured in that model. So um, uh, this is just a few examples um, of, you know, what are the potential um, uh, uh, concerns and challenges that you don't want to crop up too late, right? So uh, having a consistent water supply and treatment. Um, how you think about uh, a waste heat recovery for other applications within the microgrid system. Um, uh, this is particularly relevant for Kotzebue north of the Arctic Circle. How do you uh, engineer your systems to operate in ultra cold environments? Um, so just sort of giving the context, things that are uh, otherwise not going to be considered um, in uh, sort of the, the lab based analysis. Um, and to give some illustrative examples of where systems like this, analog systems, have been deployed in the past um, to, to also show that, you know, someone has already kind of done work like this, hydrogen and microgrids. Um, this first example is in Western Australia, operated by Horizon Power. Um, and this is a, uh, a hydrogen solar hybrid system. So it's dedicated solar panels of, of uh, just over 700 kilowatts with um, a relatively small electrolyzer and fuel cell. Um, uh, I bring this up for two reasons. One is that uh, this system scale is, is definitely on the lower end, but um, is an example of you know, where smaller systems can be sort of uh, specifically engineered for uh, smaller communities or microgrids. And also we have a team from ASEP that's going to be uh, heading out to Denim uh, in just a couple of weeks to um, meet with the folks at Horizon Power and also inspect uh, the, uh, the hydrogen and microgrid system. And so uh, we'll be really interested to uh, hear the report back from them. Um, a, uh, 
sort of on the other end of the spectrum uh, from the microgrid hydrogen standpoint is um, the system that's currently uh, being developed and was recently approved in Northern California, operated by PG&E uh, with partnerships um, with uh, Energy Vault and Plug Power. This is a dedicated uh, emergency power backup system that's being proposed with both hydrogens and, or with both uh, hydrogen fuel cells and lithium ion batteries. Um, the main uh, point to underscore here is that the, the scale is a little bit larger and might represent a sort of um, a, an aspirational uh, benchmark um, for microgrid systems in Alaska, where we have, you know, eight and a half megawatts of generating capacity, multiple days of uh, storage. In this case, the application that uh, PG&E is interested in is, is rolling blackouts and, and risks from uh, wildfires. Um, but the idea is that emergency backup power is emergency backup power and uh, can be used in a lot of uh, uh, different scenarios. Um, uh, the parallels kind of fall away there after that. Um, they're using liquid hydrogen and it's not being generated on site, um, but the end use applications are, are uh, definitely to be noted. And finally, um, this is uh, an example of uh, the facilities out at NREL at, the, at their Flatirons campus. Um, I actually got to tour this facility uh, while I was uh, at the uh, hydrogen in infrastructure workshop in Denver. Um, and uh, I think for this group in particular, this is a great one to highlight because the scale of the system, although it's intended for research purposes, is uh, pretty close to what we're exploring for Kotzebue. So one megawatt uh, uh, fuel cells with around one megawatt electrolyzer. Um, they have uh, more generating capacity than um, what's currently in Kotzebue, but you know not all of that solar and wind is going to their hydrogen facilities. Um, the important point that I want to emphasize here is uh, the scale of the system. So um, you know, neither of these pictures uh, has a you know, like a person for reference. I didn't include any that that had us in them. But um, for context, you know, these are maybe this is a field of maybe 50 meters in diameter with all of these uh, 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 subsequent shipping container sized units. Um, you know, they have one container for the electrolyzer, two for the fuel cell. And then um, uh, this array of above ground storage tanks of uh, roughly the same size. Um, so, uh, in terms of, you know, direct analogs to what we're exploring, this is a pretty good one. Um, and so, uh, where we're moving towards now on the sort of modeling side at ASAP and, and Arctic Energy is, um, to, uh, participate in the Ernest project that Aaron mentioned. So Ernest is a DOE, uh, funded project headed by Stanford. And it stands for the Equitable, Affordable, and Resilient Nationwide Energy Systems Transition. Um, and there's uh, a, a wide consortium of universities, 17 universities and four national labs that are all contributing to this project in um, a range of applications that really uh, spans um, the entirety of grid resilience as a broad concept. So some of the university partners are looking at um, you know, the really large scale transmission and distribution systems in the Western United States. Others are looking at how you make your, um, it, your you know, your individual distribution grids um, resilient to natural disasters, right? Hurricanes on the East Coast, uh, flooding and wildfires on the West Coast. Um, our contribution as the folks in Alaska is to work with our partners in Canada and Hawaii on uh, microgrid resilience, specifically for um, communities in our respective regions. So, um, you know, for our individual uh, slice of earnest, we're looking at um, essentially how we can help communities to uh, be energy self-sufficient and uh, have uh, grid resilience. Again, trying to reduce the reliance on imported diesel for diesel generators. Um, and the important component, if you're looking at the uh, sort of the renewable generation side, which we are, is for long duration storage. And for that, uh, we're looking specifically at hydrogen. Um, and uh, again, to highlight here, uh, the 
scope of earnest really stops at the modeling stage. So there's not money through this project for uh, an actual deployment. Um, that would be uh, a presumed later stage, but we're acknowledging that um, in order to sort of expedite that process, we'd like to really be considering these on the ground challenges now. We'd like to sort of do these things concurrently so that we're not blindsided by um, you know, uh, a challenge from either side, right? We don't want to uh, put off the techno-economic analysis and and uh, uh, have overwhelming costs. And we also don't want to um, have, op you know, operate only in the optimized model environment and then realize that a certain valve isn't going to work for the storage unit and uh, as a result, not be able to install anything. So we're trying to do these things concurrently. And today is really the first step on this operational challenges side to, um, try to, uh, again, really solicit feedback from this group, um, uh, which is a, a really unique overlap of people who have uh, vested interest and experience in Alaska and are interested in hydrogen. Um, so uh, let, me, let me actually pause right there before kind of going into this um, uh, hybrid discussion presentation mode and ask if there are any questions on anything so far. Um, and I'm just going to jump in here, Paul, and just yep. um, I put it in the chat, but I also just really want to um, highlight uh, Matt Bergen's role in all of this from Cotsville Electric Association. Uh, you know, he's definitely been knocking on doors, looking for ways to kick off uh, a hydrogen project there um, and has been a great partner. And uh, certainly we're using Cotsville as an example here, um, you know, mostly because we've got a willing partner, but hoping that some of these lessons and uh, can be extended to you know other communities across Alaska. Um, but again, just thanks to Matt for his participation. Um, Matt, I don't know if you want to say anything at this point other than to just keep listening. I think I saw him on here. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. I'm, I'm kind of multitasking here, picking somebody from the airport, moving around and all sorts of oh. stuff. But yeah. Um, up here in Kotzebue, where uh, you know it took us a long time to get wind to be a, a reliable source of energy, and I think it's hydrogen is along those lines too. It's going to take some time and effort to develop um, the industry and then uh, capabilities within the um, the state, but I think it's kind of the future of a uh, long duration energy storage. So thanks. If I'm Aaron, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I would like to point out the um, the electrolyzer at the Enrol facility. That's actually one of our electrolyzers, and uh, we just did a DOE workshop where we spent quite a bit of time explaining a lot of the operational challenges that we see with customers trying to install these electrolyzers. And we actually have just installed one of our own. And it was pretty eye-opening to see some of the issues that we ran into. And we would be very happy to offer any kind of uh, insights that anyone would like to hear um, as far as, you know, some of the commercial challenges and technical challenges that, you know, we've run into and our customers have run into and in trying to get the electrolyzers up and running. Thank you. Were you by chance at the same workshop Paul was at in Denver or was this different? Uh, this one was online, so he may okay. have been there in person where I may have been. Uh, I'm I'm in Houston, so uh, I, okay. it may have been a little bit, may have been the same one. Okay. Anthony, can I ask, so uh, just where was the location of that most recent deployment? Oh, the one that we bought for ourselves? It's in Wallingford, Connecticut. Okay. And okay. you're all very welcome to come visit it if you would like. Awesome. Excellent. I'll yield the floor to uh, any other questions. Aaron, this is Bob Real, And uh, I've uh, spoken to Paul in the past and to Matt. And one of the questions I have is, um, assuming that you could generate hydrogen now, would you want to start using that hydrogen as a way to uh, improve the uh, current uh, diesel generator uh, uh, environment so that you would be generating more power uh, and use less diesel? 
as opposed to having to go to a totally separate step down the road with storing that hydrogen and, and using fuel cells. I'll jump in for a second here. Um, I think this gets to end use applications and, and identifying those really clearly, which is something we're gonna talk about here. Um, okay. Are you suggesting using, and I will just ask and then we'll, we'll move on here. Are you suggesting using hydrogen um, not in a fuel cell to generate uh, power? Just to clarify your question. Actually using the hydrogen with the existing diesel engines. Okay. Uh, so uh, blending? Basically in, as, a, okay. as, as a dual fuel environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's been done elsewhere. So. Yeah, and, and I'll just jump in and, and say that uh, sort of uh, e either uh, genset ret retrofitting or, um, you know, specifically hydrogen engineered generators is one of those end use applications that we would, um, you know, definitely be exploring. Um, the inclusion of the fuel cell in the schematic is definitely the default as something that's currently being deployed and, and demonstrated. But um, I, I don't. I would not uh, want to say that we're sort of locked into that necessarily, and that's one of because the again, decision if, points. If you can basically reduce not only the cost of the primary fuel that you're using right now, and if you could generate enough hydrogen, theoretically, you could run those diesel engines on pure hydrogen down the road and you know, eliminate all your imported cost. All right, let's put a pin in that for when we get to end use applications. Really appreciate that question. Okay. Um, this is the kind of discussion we, we hope to have here. Are there any sort of clarifying questions on what's been covered uh, so far before we jump in, knowing that we wanna keep things moving here as well? Aaron, Tim Leach, apologies for joining late. So this may have been covered. Uh, what's the timeline on the project? Uh, and, and if so, is there some potential for overlap on other projects down at the Port of Alaska, for example? Um, I think the timeline is TBD. Uh, okay. uh, so that's probably an open topic for discussion. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I see there's a potential at least for um, co-developing uh, the list of operational challenges, uh, Paul, that you're asking about here. And knowing Kotzebue is a bit colder, uh, say, than, than uh, Anchorage area, um, you know, there might be some advantages that we can um, build into the scope of research anyway in those two different operating environments, uh, as well as with some of the different use cases that I, I believe are going to be there between the two projects. Great. Thank you, Tim. Yep. All right. Sure. Why don't you keep on going, Paul, here, just for the sake of getting through everything? Sure. Uh, and, and I'll just add that I, I think Tim's point is a, is a really good segue um, because uh, some of the challenges that we're identifying here are going to be more, um, you know, situationally and community dependent than others, um, which is to say that there are a lot of things that will be translatable. And I think that there's there is likely a lot of uh, room for overlap as we explore different use applications for hydrogen in the state. Um, so uh, I showed a brief preview, and if you're on the Jamboard, then you kind of see the categories that um, we're aiming to cover here. Um, oops. So uh, like I said, I, I sort of want to just give a, a brief overview of each of these um, and then allow some time for uh, quick feedback and, and give people time to uh, add to the board. As I'm talking, please feel free to contribute um, uh, if, if something is already uh, uh, coming to you. Um, but for the context of Kotzebue, one of the first things we're trying to think about is operation in cold climates. So uh, north of the Arctic Circle, um, especially for uh, uh, storage, thinking ahead towards seasonal storage in winter, um, we want to be particularly, particularly mindful about um, durability of outdoor equipment. So in the context of the hydrogen microgrid system, this is particularly relevant for storage as well as all of the auxiliary connection components. Um, NREL has done some really nice analysis of uh, 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 
different um, component ratings and not even in the context of Alaska or the Arctic, right? Compressors, nozzles, and gaskets tend to be items that you uh, that are more prone to failure. And that uh, that risk is only compounded as you move to really cold temperatures, you know, minus 40 degrees. Um, the last item here is trying to think about what is a reasonable and realistic capacity factor for the electrolyzer and fuel cell system. If you're only going to be using and generating hydrogen for a very short amount of time, you want to make sure that you're not letting that equipment freeze or let pipes freeze. Um, and uh, that also contributes to, uh, you know, what are your end use applications? How constant of a need is it? Um, and so some of the pathways that we're thinking about, uh, again, everything in the potential pathways is sort of a, uh, a malleable list that we're really looking for feedback on. But we've reached out to some uh, uh, suppliers who are currently working on cold rated systems. Um, we would love to, to talk extensively and more with the folks at Nell um, and, and hear about uh, their work on this topic. Um, and then uh, also trying to look a little bit closer to home at local industry partners um, who maybe don't operate in hydrogen specifically, but have that experience with, you know, compressors, nozzles, gaskets, those uh, things that have um, uh, translatable applications outside of just hydrogen. Um, uh, this is definitely an aspirational goal, but uh, we've had discussions within ASAP and with others that at some point, as there is more uh, interest within uh, the hydrogen space, it would be great if we could do some of our own pilot testing, if not with an entire hydrogen system of things like sensors um, and uh, maybe some of these other auxiliary components. Um, so that was a bit of a speed run, but I'll, I'll pause there. Uh, and uh, really encourage folks to contribute uh, uh, either uh, challenges that are not included on this list or sort of ways around, um, uh, uh, you know, some of these potential uh, hangups um, from their own experience or their own industry, um, or just ask questions um, as well. And I'll jump in as a moderator here. Um, this is meant to be, we're, we're going to have, you know, five minutes or so of discussion on each of these sort of four main buckets of operational challenges. And this is meant to be both verbal as well as uh, Jamboard um, based. So multiple methods of um, engagement here. And, and really the purpose of the Jamboard is, or, or one of the purposes is to make sure we capture all ideas just because we can't talk about everything in, in just a few minutes if we want to keep moving through. So um, we'd love to hear from uh, any of you about um, you know, other cold rated systems, um, you know, um, local industry partners who may have uh, some expertise in some of the auxiliary uh, pieces and parts um, and or any, you know, testing uh, pathways as well. So let's just open it up to a discussion here. Thank you, Mike, for jumping in. Uh, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. Sorry for being late. Uh, I had a PT class this morning. Hey, I, uh, it's interesting that you bring up this cold climate issue. There was a newsletter put out by Senator Giesel yesterday uh, talking about the fact that these uh, wind turbines are not making power in the cold temperatures in Alaska. And it uh, kind of leads me into this conversation. Uh, you know, we've been operating at Delta Junction for 14 years now, and on many occasions have uh, been operating at 40 below or colder. Uh, I think our record was 51 below. And we've learned a lot about uh, uh, these, how these machines operate and the electronics and uh, some of the other components on the turbines. And uh, also limiting, uh, for example, with the uh, EWT turbines being direct drive as opposed to a transmission driven turbine, that's one of those points where you've limited your exposure to cold sinking. And I, I, I think that there's a lot of easy, simple solutions going back to running heavy equipment in the winter time you know, with parasitic loads that are reasonable, things like these 75 watt heaters on the side of a of a device or, or, or a small 50 watt heater inside of an electrical cabinet, you know, that, that don't create these huge parasitic loads. And I think that that is the industry standard is to go to this atom bomb type of approach to uh, keeping things from cold sinking. You know, let's put a 10,000 watt electric heater into a unit as opposed to a, a 75 watt heater with an insulating blanket on top of it. 
So there, there's definitely been a lot of progress made in, in operating in cold temperatures. And it's not the, uh, the, the, the uh, scary uh, critter that a lot of people think it is. It just takes a little bit of foresight. And again, you know, there's no reason to throw an atom bomb at the problem when you can solve it with a, with a small hanger need, so to speak. So if anybody wants more information on what we've done in Delta Junction to keep these turbines operational, we, we run 70, 80% capacity factors at minus 40 last week. So uh, if anybody's got any questions about what we're doing out there to deal with the cold sinking issues, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mike. There's a quick clarifying question from Matt Bergen as to which turbines are not working in the cold. Well, that uh, remains to be seen. I think it was a blanket statement that Senator Giesel made. She did refer to Fire Island and Eva Creek. And both of those uh, locations are operating transmission driven turbines. The GEs and the uh, repowers are both transmission driven turbines, which kind of create another whole issue with respect to uh, the volume of oil. Uh, when I first looked at the GE turbines, for example, back in 2010, it was anticipated that it was going to take about 50 kilowatts parasitic load to keep them from cold sinking uh, at mm -hmm. Delta Junction. So uh, she was specifically talking about those two projects. Uh, she didn't say anything about Kotzebue or Nome or Delta or some of the places that are using the direct drive technology or the Northern 100s with the direct drive technology. So Okay. And I'm not real sure what he's actually talking about. It okay. Really... Okay. I'm uh, sure there's yeah. lots more to unpack there. I, yeah. JR, I see your hand up. Did you want to add to this discussion? Yeah, just, you know, I, I mean, I've been actively working on the engineering of, a, of a, an Arctic rated plant. And one of the, you know, I, I it's one thing to look at this sort of on a, on a schematic, but generally... I mean, what we've found is, is you know, like in the lower 48, you might be, or a more temperate climate, you might be able to scatter a lot of this infrastructure around. And in the Arctic, you're really going to want to consolidate it into, uh, in, you know, a, a building or something so that you can start playing with the the waste heat and use it to, to preheat other things. And like, if I've got an electrolyzer producing oxygen over here and a fuel cell consuming it over there, and then I've got a water tank that's you know taking the water coming out of the electrolyzer and so that the fuel cell can take it when it wants to the more i can compress things into one area and then start optimizing my inputs and my outputs um the the easier it's going to be to keep keep the environment from being adverse sounds like stage advice thank you um has anyone had any um experience or or you know, seen put eyes on the Accelera system that Paul mentions as specifically a cold rated system. This is the company formerly known as Hydrogenics, by the way. They were recently acquired by Cummins. They operate primarily out of Canada. Well, if there's not input on that particular point, um, Aaron, I might I might defer to you as uh, a moderator here. Uh, we have a few points on the shared board. Um, we can either go through them now or we can circle back. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, why don't we? Why don't we? Let's let's go through a few of them here. There aren't too many of them here, um, and I think we're still doing okay on time. Um, can you see the board, Paul, or do you want me to talk through it? Um, I, I can, but it's a little far away. So I'll, uh, I'll, I might be making your point a little bit larger if you're looking at the board, but, um, okay. yeah. So I think, uh, what, one of the things that stood out to me was this point about, uh, extreme cold shrinks and expands materials, causes leaks and failures. Modern construction materials are old technology and new modern materials should be tested. I'm just curious if the, the, uh, contributor there um, has any specific materials in mind that they've either worked with or seen used in the past, if you're able to um, give some context for that point. Maybe, maybe we'll give some some time for uh, uh, in case that person wants to circle back and, and move on and maybe come back to it. 
Well, um, were, you, were you talking to me specifically? Um, uh, maybe, my, Mike. Mike, is that is that your point on the Jamboard, the extreme cold one? No. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate your verbal feedback, though, Mike. Yeah, I talk better than I write. <laughs> Fair um, enough. We, yeah. What about local industry sectors or partners? Um, to reach out to to solve some of these problems or you know potential problems with um sort of auxiliary pieces and parts um gas storage in the cold um that may not necessarily you know be hydrogen oriented but uh may be able to provide sort of on the ground experience know-how Well, I can tell you that the towers, for example, and some of the other components that we used in Delta Junction were special materials. Uh, there are certain places where you have to consider these issues relating to uh, uh, metal fatigue. Uh, and so we we worked with a company out of Washington State to, uh, to come up with an alloy that we wanted to use for the turbines towers themselves and the the bolts and some of the other things that uh, are structural in the tower. So the metallurgy of some of these materials is critical when you start talking about uh, minus 40 degrees, especially if there's vibrations and stuff like that. So that's that's one of the things we did in Delta. And then just going back to uh, you know my experience with heavy equipment over the last 40 years and uh, having to start a D8 bulldozer at 30 below zero, there's, there's, there's just certain components on that dozer that you you protect yourself from cold sinking. And uh, in particular, the pony motor, which is a gas motor that starts with the diesel motor and the battery. And so, you know, we, we made sure that we had those situations covered with, uh, with uh, heaters on the pony motor and heaters on the batteries. And uh, a procedure, a startup procedure is also critical in when you come out of a cold sink, your startup procedure has to take into account uh, the warming of particular components in, a, in, a, in order. Uh, that helps a lot towards uh, not just turning the machine on and turning it loose, but in, the, in, in an example of a wind turbine is letting that thing spin for a while before you actually try to make power with it and let the bearings warm up and some of the other components warm up from frictional loads and stay away from the parasitic loads that you have to buy. So startup procedures is probably one of the biggest issues that 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 I see relating to cold weather operations. Okay, thank you. Right. And Anthony Borski, I see your hand up. I'd love yeah. to hear your input on this coming from now. Sure, sure. Uh, Aaron, so our uh, our electrolyzers have HVAC inside of the containers. So they've we put them in Switzerland, and we have one in particular um, that I would invite you to go speak to the owner. Um, it's on at Nine Mile Point. Um, in Oswego, New York, it's it's literally on uh, Lake Ontario shore. Um, they bought a unit in conjunction with NREL, so it's Constellation Energy in, in conjunction with NREL, and uh, they did a lot of cold weather proofing of the entire system, you know, with the compressor and even the storage tanks, and they did some really smart things that they learned, and um, if you would like to reach out to them. I mean, they could probably give you a, a lot more information about what they've done, but they, you know, they, I don't, I don't know that they got to minus 40, but it gets pretty darn cold um, on that site. So they have a lot of experience with that. And if you're looking for a specific person, Bob Beaumont would be a great contact to reach out to. Okay, great. Well, they certainly get lake effect snow up there. So great. We may follow up with you. That's awesome. And, and I might just, Briefly uh, respond, and, and first of all, Anthony, thank you for that that input. That's that's really really good to know. Um, and I I might just use that to sort of address some of the points that are on the board mentioning um, you know electrolyzer efficiencies uh, operate well at at sort of higher temperatures uh, to begin with, and sort of this idea of consolidating things. I think that those are those are aspects that uh, uh, my understanding is that Nell is sort of already kind of doing that with some of their containerized units. And just for clarification, um, the, the assumption that we're making is that 
there would be thermal regulation for the electrolyzer and the fuel cell units. Um, it's really, when we're talking about the cold, it's really that storage and connection pieces that we're concerned yes. with. Yeah. Um, and so it would be great to hear about what sort of cold testing uh, your team has done. Um, again, maybe minus 40 isn't currently in that temperature rating. It's it's not uh, not a very uh, common uh, request, but um, that's that's the fail point that we're looking at is when yeah, it gets sure. that cold, right? Yep. You know, we, so we just have, for the audience. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 no. That it was really interesting. So we we have some units in Switzerland as well that that get fairly cold. And and what we did was we've we've upgraded the um, HVAC system, so we kind of mm. beefed up the heater, um, and then we had. Um, some upgrades to the, you know, what is essentially the cooling system to keep it from freezing mm -hmm. um, with some glycol spray. And then we've, as far as like the systems themselves, uh, they don't really necessarily operate more efficiently at higher temperatures. Uh, we just maintain a pretty constant temperature inside the container. Um, and the real risk in any PIM uh, system is actually damaging the cell stack if it freezes. So, you know, the cell stack's filled with water and if it freezes, you ruin it. So, you know, the storage and, you know, ensuring that there's some sort of backup heating system or some sort of, um, um, you know, UPS system that makes sure that, um, you know, essentially that HVAC will always be on. And those are really the ways that, that our customers have protected them in, in very cold weather. It's great. Great. We should probably move on, Paul. Uh, yep, yep, I think that's fine. And so if, if we didn't come to your point uh, uh, during this intermediate discussion, we're hoping that there will be time to, to sort of circle back to, to any remaining um, points on any of the topics before we wrap up. And if we don't, we'll happily follow up with you um, offline. Um, just so that we move on, though, uh, the, the next category that we're thinking about is um, microgrid integration and applications. Um, I will note that uh, we expect that this is this category is fairly uh, uh, community dependent, and so uh, in the the example of Kotzebue, for example, we would really defer to uh, Matt and and the folks at KEA on you know what is uh, a useful way to um, use and integrate hydrogen into their existing system. Um, so the feedback that we're looking for here is, is a little bit more general, but again, sort of uh, maybe a little bit more translatable towards different applications. Um, the main point that I'll underscore here is that there's a decision point that we're uh, envisioning in how you use hydrogen. So uh, if you use a fuel cell to generate electricity versus if you uh, uh, use direct consumption in um uh, an engine, as uh, as was previously mentioned, or even uh, making a, a derivative uh, fuel source, depending on what your your particular end use is. Um, if you are using a fuel cell, though, uh, there is a question of you know, do you want to direct power um, towards a standalone application, or do you want to bring it online with the rest of your um, your micro grid uh, uh, grid system, and then. Um, the last point, this is very, very uh, situationally dependent, but um, if, if the goal is to ultimately replace diesel generators, uh, as, as we're sort of mentioning here, um, you know, what are the secondary applications outside of just the power that comes from those gen sets? So uh, one, one that we've discussed uh, a bit is the fact that excess heat from generators is used for water heating and space heating. Um, is that something that you can replicate with uh, a hydrogen substitute? Um, and so in terms of potential pathways, uh, to be honest, this is an area where there is overlap between the modeling and the sort of the practical investigations. Um, and so uh, things like uh, microgrid integration would be considered under, under the purview of our earnest efforts. Um, uh, but sort of some of these outside considerations, you know, the, uh, the heat load requirements, I would also include, uh, you know, water treatment requirements in this category. Those are the kinds of things that we're, uh, hoping to, um, sort of uncover here. Um, so again, let me pause there, um, and, uh, encourage folks to contribute. This is the second page of the Jamboard. So it's not under cold climates. There's another one for microgrid integration and applications. 
one person is ahead of the game and has already contributed, but we'd encourage you to put your thoughts there or um, uh, contribute verbally. And so to jump in here, the questions on the Jamboard are, hey, Bill, can you mute yourself, please? Um, the questions here are, what are potential end use alternatives to hydrogen powered fuel cells for microgrid AC bus integration? Uh, and what are secondary applications, i.e. excess heat consumption that need to be considered for hydrogen to replace diesel gen sets? Um, we'd love to hear input there, either from folks who have thought a little bit more about uh, excess heat from hydrogen versus um, from fuel cells versus um, diesel gen sets. Um, you know, I don't know if, if you know, the, that exact balance has been done for, for this scenario. Um, as well as some of these other questions. And maybe to kick it off, Paul, can you talk a little bit about some of the envisioned end use applications in Kotzebue and secondary applications that you've discussed with Matt? Sure. Um... So I'll, I'll uh, definitely mention the, the few that we've discussed. I, well, I, I think that the, uh, the main secondary application um, is excess heat recovery. Um, I'll, I'll definitely defer to Matt on the uh, particular uh, details of the end use applications, but um, essentially for both uh, water heating as well as space heating for the immediate surroundings, um, we would not necessarily be operating under the assumption that um, that heat load would be met with a sort of a standalone hydrogen system. Um, so we would expect that, uh, you know, a heat recovery or uh, um, a heat transfer system would also sort of need to be subsequently put in place. Um, I'll, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to Matt though, if he has other um, uh, envisioned ideas. Yeah, as far as um, kind of what we're thinking about as far as uses for the hydrogen, um, of course, there's the primary course is power generation, um, producing the hydrogen seasonally or via storms. We get these pretty intense storms with a lot of energy in the atmosphere that we can capture all that energy. Um, and then in the end, convert it back to electric power to the grid. Uh, either through a fuel cell or potentially um, retrofitting our gensets or maybe a dedicated hydrogen dual fuel genset in the future, um, reciprocating genset. Um, but that's the primary, putting it back into power for the grid to um, further reduce our diesel consumption. Um, uh, secondary uses would be for either local transportation or potentially for heating, home heating. Um, it's something they're looking at quite a bit in Europe and other places as far as for converting some of these natural gas distribution lines into hydrogen, uh, or at least blending them for now. But um, the, by far the highest cost of living in Kotzebue is um, not electricity. It's actually heating, home heating. Fuel is about nine bucks a gallon. And um, so it costs a lot more to heat your home and make hot water than it is to have electricity for lights and internet, stuff like that. So that would be another use. And like I said, transportation um, for whatever type of vehicle might use hydrogen down the road. So that's what I got. Hey, Matt, this is Levi Kilcher with Arctic Energy. I was curious, do you have a sense of like the time scale of the gaps you're trying to fill in your electrical system versus the frequency that the storms are coming through like is it are the storms coming through once a month or sort of seasonally there's a gap of three months that you're trying to fill um any thoughts on that yeah, I mean we've we're we get a lot of blizzards here and um and then it's just sort of been a little just more stormy lately. Um seems like January it blew about 40 or 50 here for 3 weeks or so. It was pretty pretty brutal. 
But um, if we were capturing all that energy with additional wind turbines, we could store quite a bit of energy for, for use um, when it, the wind stops, you know. So we probably have 20, 20 to 30 significant storm events here through the year. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where trying to find that sweet spot of how many wind turbines to install to capture all this excess wind that's going by um, to, to take advantage of that. And then there's also, of course, the seasonal solar production too, trying to do a bunch of solar production in the spring and summer to store that for winter as well. So using what we got here, brutal storms make for a lot of energy. Fine. Thank you. Um, Aaron, I'm just kind of perusing the board here. Um, I think that there are some, uh, some points that we've sort of discussed, uh, synthetic hydrocarbon fuel, uh, parenthetical requires carbon capture of some form, uh, i.e. generator exhaust and a reactor, um, easier storage, uh, can, can be used in generators. Um, other points also, uh, mention use of hydrogen in engines or boilers to produce power directly. Um, uh, uh, similar point on direct use of hydrogen uh, for heat, similar to natural gas, and then methanol or ammonia synthesis. Um, so I, I think definitely some uh, some through lines with the uh, trade-offs and how you might directly consume hydrogen or in the latter point, uh, produce methanol or ammonia derivatives. Um, but, but just a note that uh, I think all, all of those are areas that we're uh, uh, looking into um, and uh, including maybe some folks who are on the call today uh, by invitation specifically around this use of um, uh, hydrogen uh, generators and, and deploying technologies other than fuel cells. Well, and I, I hope it's obvious from that those notes that, you know, there's one note that somebody put up about synthetic hydrocarbons. There's a different note about methanol and ammonia, but both of those, you know, it, it doesn't really fit in column left or column right neatly because you could either use those any of those three things as fuel or you could use it as a product yeah i'm going to interject here tim i do see your hand up but we have only 10 minutes left um so i'm going to keep just moving here and hopefully we can get to your comment at the end uh no offense intended um so paul can you keep why don't you keep on going for now okay um so uh the uh, next category that we're considering is actual installation, maintenance, and repairs. Um, uh, for the purposes of this session and for the sake of time, um, the main point that I want to underscore here is the trade-off between um, uh, installing a fully integrated system, sort of a plug-and-play system, versus sourcing components from uh, a variety of vendors and um, integrating them together in Alaska. Um, so uh, I know we have our friends from Nell who are on the call and sort of um, uh, uh, have extensive work in that former category. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to be very mindful of how remote Alaska is relative to uh, where a lot of hydrogen companies operate and um, can source uh, uh, people focused on repairs from. Um, and the fact that we're hoping that uh, a transition to hydrogen um, also comes with a developing workforce in the state. So um, uh, again, that's kind of that, that's really the main point that I want to underscore here is uh, we're trying to be thoughtful about um, how and where we actually source uh, uh, components for the system from. Um, and maybe I'll just leave it there for a moment to uh, let folks provide feedback. Okay, I see there JR has his hand up. Um, JR, did you raise your hand? And also people can move to the next uh, page three Jamboard as well. Go ahead, JR. Yes, I did. Sorry, just because I've, I've been living this um, very, very much over the last uh, uh, year as we've gone through class three engineering for the, the methanol plant. And I would submit that those are two extremes and you're probably not going to do either approach. Um, you know, what we found is you're really going to want to do is, what, what, is you're going to come up with a solution that you 
there's not going to be a ready-made solution that's going to fit for Kotzebue. You know, um, on the other hand, it's going to be wildly expensive to try and do 100% of it in the state. So you're probably going to wind up with an engineering team that understands the Arctic, that's sourcing components and doing the engineering in order to tie those together for your solution. And it's going to be a little bit of both. Okay. And I think along with that is, you know, do we have the workforce either locally or, you know, within the state, uh, to, you know, to operate and maintain and repair these systems, or is it going to require bringing in specialists? And that, you know, adds a, another degree of complexity uh, to working uh, systems in remote Alaska. Well, yeah, I mean, but, but what you're going to want to do is when you get this thing together, there's going to be a commissioning process. And through the commissioning process, there's going to have to be a lot of documentation that's developed and your operators trained. And those operators are going to need to be trained kind of through the process of the commissioning. And, and that's going to enable you to sort of have that that maintenance workforce. But that's a lot different than your design you know, team that you're using in order to try and assemble this thing. On the workforce piece, I think there's, uh, at least for the vehicle side of things that I've been working on, there is some interest, I believe, within our university system uh, to build curriculum towards these types of technologies. Uh, so I think those are early, converse, early conversations at this point, but I think on uh, some of the stationary fuel cells, you know, similar tech, obviously, um, there might be some opportunity to, you know, using a demonstration project like this and the commissioning that JR was just talking about, essentially to go and kick the tires and for those who are building the curriculum into university programs, this might be the opportunity to say, hey, this might be something to uh, follow on for, for training of our workforce as we get students through the university program or if it's apprenticeship programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate JR's comment about uh, in integrated systems and plug or, or customized versus fully integrated systems being extremes. Um, but I think I, th I think there there's certainly the 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 boundaries of the discussion. Right. And, oh yeah. And I, I think Matt's go ahead, Matt. Say yeah, I guess um, me being I'm being a little hopeful here, but in the long run, it'd be kind of nice if our friends and neighbors in the Alaska hydrocarbon industry can. Um, evolve or adapt into the hydrocarbon and hydrogen industry as well. A lot of a lot of the stuff they design and build has to do with explosive environments of natural gas and oil and stuff like that. And there's probably some synergy there is what I'm thinking. Yep. And okay. Matt, the uh, process tech certification through Kenai Peninsula College, in my mind, is exactly one of those feeder programs uh, currently oriented towards oil and gas, but would be good for hydrogen. Excellent. Yeah, All I mean, right, we're, let's, we're, we're let's doing exactly ahead. that. I mean, it's, oh, sorry, it's just, yeah, we, we've, we were building a, you know, plant using hydrogen on the North Slope. And so a lot of the engineering um, that we're doing and a lot of the operations we're doing is, is exactly... Um, it doesn't take a lot of adaptation from a hydrocarbon environment. Okay. That's great to know. Go ahead and keep on moving, Paul. Yep. I think we'll round it out right at the top of the hour here. Um, uh, so uh, a lot of those uh, mentions of um, following following policies and, and uh, uh, processes, I think is a nice segue into our last one here, citing permitting and regulation. Um, this I, I I recognize that this is a beast of a topic. The intent here is not to sort of get into the weeds of you know what uh, the actual siting permitting process will look like. Um, what we're hoping to do is uh, identify where we can adapt this process, acknowledging that this is a, a relatively new um, and nascent area for Alaska, so that we can expedite all three of these, the siting, permitting, and, you know, regulatory side. So um, we've uh, had some discussions with Matt, uh, who's who's given some really helpful insight into um, having, you know, both the uh, state and local um, uh, fire authorities sign off. Um, there's uh, general guidance for hydrogen technologies to um, have all of your components and uh, systems be compliant with 
um, the, uh, the National Fire Protection Association and the International Fire Code. Um, we would really love in, in the few minutes that we have remaining um, where uh, some feedback on, um, you know, what are the stages of this process that you've encountered in your Alaska operations in the past um, or currently um, that have uh, either maybe been headaches and things to avoid or, or places where you've, you've learned and been able to sort of expedite the process, um, especially if you're going to in introduce um, a technology like hydrogen, which already doesn't have a whole lot of standardization um, uh, across these three areas and is also, frankly, a flammable gas and has its own hazards that come with it. Um, Matt, I see your hand up. I don't know if that's a vestige from the last discussion or if you've got something you want to add here. Uh, looks like Matt's going to go silent, but JR does have his hand up. Go ahead, JR. Sorry, just a quick comment. I think, you know, you'll you'll find you're going to need to enclose a lot of this system, um, that, but then you're going to have to uh, make sure that you're doing really good work on your fire and gas. Uh, it's going to be gas detection, ventilation, et cetera, and you're going to have to be engineering for an explosive environment. That's something we don't have to deal with in Texas where everything's outdoors. That that a bit other than that, I think you know nothing should be completely non-standard. That's that's sort of the more you know it'd be better be thinking about this ahead of time kind of area. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow up, Jr. So so in the context of the methanol facility that you mentioned uh, on the North Slope, um, was was that uh, uh, an area or or an application that was already sort of on the radar of the local fire marshals and they sort of already had some familiar familiarity with, or did you sort of have to um, make a new pitch for, you know, the, how the, their standard process might need to be adapted for a, a, a new facility? No, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, and we're still, all these conversations are still live, but just, you know, to make sure everybody understands so we're, we're starting with natural gas, we're turning it into hydrogen rich synthesis gas. And then that's getting turned into a, a hydrogen stream, which we're using to treat diesel and it's getting turning into methanol. So we, we are dealing with a lot of hydrogen. We're also dealing with natural gas. We're also dealing with flammable liquids. Um, the, the North Slope fire marshal is used to dealing with flammable gases and flammable liquids in a contained environment. This is something we actually deal with in Alaska a lot. People in the lower 48 don't deal with this. You know, they, they you know, we, for example, you know, our natural, you know, our, our oil and gas wells are in houses, you know, so like you see these emissions numbers, all this methane that goes out, you know, in the atmosphere, that's a lower 48 thing, right? Like if we leak natural gas, it would fill up the well house and the thing would come in explosive environments. So we got gas detection, even in those little well houses to keep them from freezing up in the winter. So the, the amount of, if you're, if you're bringing people in from outside, they're, they're going to come at this with a completely different expectation for um, enclosures. And so that, that's where you want to have people from, you know, Alaska, Canada, or be people that are at least experienced in Arctic construction. And that's one thing that will tend to be different for them is the fact that, you know, you need to have a, a good fire and gas detection philosophy. And I, I, you know, I think I've got engineers who are far more credentialed than I am on this call. They could probably be talking to this better, but that's just a, <laughs> what I've, I've noticed is different in these systems here. Great, thank you. Any other quick comments on siting with an S, permitting or regulation? <laughs> I saw that note. Yeah. Messes up my acronym, but here we're <laughs> great for spelling right. clarity. It's, uh, yeah, we'll switch yeah. it back. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Paul. We are at the top of the hour here. I, I think you have a final slide. Is that correct? Um, I, I do. I'll, I'll, so this is just the the um, the review and summary of the questions that we have uh, in the jam board. I'll note that we have another uh, a board slide for any additional considerations that we didn't cover. We know that they're uh, that they exist. So we would love your feedback on that uh, if since you also have the link or if you'd like to follow up offline. Um, and then uh, I think we'll be able to distribute these slides, but uh, I've just included here um, a few of the reference materials that we've been looking at and that uh, uh, we're using when we're thinking about all of these um, 
uh, best practices and uh, on the ground challenges. Um, so they're there for your reference. And uh, again, if you have any other suggestions or um, wants to contribute, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. And with that, um, I will just say that we are out of time. We will send uh, this slide deck out, especially for anyone who wants those references at the end. Um, thank you all for participating. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, March 5th. Uh, and we will send out information about that ahead of time. Uh, this meeting has been recorded. We will send out a recording. We will send out a copy of the slides. Uh, we appreciate um, all of your input. Um, please feel free to follow up. And uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Matt, um, for leading this discussion. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all in another month for another uh, lively session of our hydrogen working group. Take care, everyone.